Now, I'm going to continue with counseling, and I'm going to explain again what we said yesterday. It's very, very important to realize that counseling is useful in daily life. Counseling is useful in daily life. So all this you learn here, if you can learn it, is very helpful to you. And a natural tendency of people, because people live in the law, most people live in the law. Hopefully, my teaching will help you to live in the grace of God, but it's not easy. It is not easy, because you have a, we all have a natural tendency to live in the law and, and to be affected by people. So when you learn it, when you learn, when you learn counseling, then you apply in your life. How do you apply? When people talk about the problems, we listen. We pay attention to their feelings. And then we respond to the feelings. Now yesterday I asked you, if you are hurting, if you are sick, if someone says to you, go see the hospital, then you don't feel anything. Or someone yells at you and then you, somebody says, well, don't, don't, don't be bothered by him, just don't talk to him. Then it doesn't comfort you. But if the person says, I know you are suffering, can you say it with me? I know your suffering. I know your pain. I know it's difficult for you. And I want to say this. It is difficult for pastors to say this. Because pastors are used to teach. When the person says someone hurt him, immediately the pastor will say, pray for him, forgive him, go do something to him, be nice to him. Immediately telling him what to do. And also for leaders, for teachers, it's easy for us to teach. And to counsel first is to listen to the person and feel the feeling. Feel the feeling. I know it's painful for you, so feel the feeling. Now, if it, at home, if someone says I'm painful, you feel the feeling, then you have a chance to be accepted by the person. But very often, People might say different things. They will say, don't tell me all this garbage. I don't want to hear. Uh, that, you know, that we might be doing this. Uh, it's your fault. It's your fault. You, you treat people badly, so people treat you badly. So we can be saying different things like this to people. And so many people told me the family members are not behaving, the children are not listening, the children are not going to school, the children don't obey. And then they will say, you are no use, you are no use, I don't like you, you have to work hard, if not you'll be a beggar. So that's very often people do this. But when we do this, it doesn't help, right? The person feel you don't understand. So even when your child doesn't go to school and have problem, in the exam, then you say, it must make you feel very bad. But you say, I just want to punish him. <laughs> I, I want to say this factually. Many people just say, I want to punish you because you didn't go to school, you didn't study, you didn't listen, you didn't learn. And so we want to tell him, you are wrong, you are wrong, you are wrong, you have to obey. And that is teaching, and that's also accusing. And it's go not going to change people. How come so many people's children are not obeying, are rebelling? Because, now first the children themselves have problem. Secondly, the parents themselves very often accuse and tell them, you have to do this, do that. Have you tried this with your children? You have to study, you have to study, you have to work hard. And the more you tell them what not to do, they will do it secretly. They won't obey, right? In order to change them, first we understand the feelings and we say, I know it's difficult, you, you know, schoolwork is difficult. You agree with them, it's difficult. It's difficult for you. So you have no motivation to study. And I understand that it's very difficult for you. And I love you and I want to help you, and God loves you, and God wants to help you. So 
say comforting words. And then we can say something like this. Now, I'm guiding now. Do you believe you are an important person or no? Do you believe that, that you are special? Now, he might not believe. And then we want to tell them this. These are positive things, words of grace. God loves you, you are important, you, you can do great things special. for God, you are special, you have special gifts that other people don't have and you can be used by God greatly. And do you want to? Do you want to become a great person? And you can become a great person. And then if the person says yes, then you can ask him, okay, now I believe that you can be a great person and I will help you along. I will help you along. I will go together with you. So if you want to be a great person, what do you need to do? You ask instead of tell. Instead of telling them, you ask. So if you want to be a great person, what do you need to do? And then um, he might say something else. And then you want him to say studying. And then you, you can say, well, how about studying? Is it important? And ask instead of saying, you have to go to school if you want to be a great person. Very easily that we start to teach and say, if you want to be a great person, you have to study. Is it true? Very often we tell them what to do. The moment we tell them, people generally, if they already re reject you, they would reject what you say. They will be angry inside. So instead of that, we guide them to think, to understand that your life is important. If you want to be a great person, what can you do? And how about studying? What can you do? And then if a person says, yes, I need to study, I need to work hard, but it's hard, it's difficult. Schoolwork is difficult. And then you say, okay, it's difficult. Now I'm here, I'm doing counseling, teaching counseling, mm. but at the same time, I'm, I'm teaching how to help your children. Yeah. Help, how to help the children. Yeah. So then you say, okay, I know it's hard to study. And then you can say, when I was young too, when I study, I have difficulty. And then you can say to a pastor, you training session, I have problem learning everything. <laughs> so I understand that it's hard for you. And so we understand the difficulty. And then we can ask, so how can we overcome the problem? Now say this with me. We, we want to ask instead of teach. So you can say this, um, start from the beginning again. Start from the beginning. So the, your ch child doesn't want to study and then what do you say? I know it's difficult for you to study. Say, it. I know it's difficult to study. And it's hard work. And you might not understand. So you get frustrated. And you want to give up. Okay? So we can say that. Now it doesn't mean when I say that he wants to give up, that I encourage him to give up. I just understand he wants to give up. And I know that it's difficult. And and sometimes we can say, ask something like this. Do you want to give up? Do you want to give up? Say it. Do you want, do you to, want give to give up? If he says, I want to give up, do you, want to, do you really want to give up? And then he says, uh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Okay. And then you can say, think about it. If you give up, what will happen? Say this. If you give up, what will happen? So you guide the person to think. If you give up, what will happen? And then he says, if I give up, I won't be able to go to school. I will, you know, won't be able to go to university and I won't be able to go higher in education. That's right. That's great. Say that. That's, That's right. right. That's, That's great. great. It's great that you understand that. Say it. It's great, it's great that you understand that. So if you know that's a problem, what do you want to do? Say it. So if you know that's the problem, what do you want to do? What do you want to do? And then, do you believe you, are, you can become a great person? Say it. Now, I'm asking you to say all the things I would say to a child if you want to raise up the child. So we want to ask, do you believe that you can become a great person? Do you know if God wants to make you a great person? So if God wants to make you a great person, 
Can you become a great person? And in order to become a great person, what do you need to do? How about study? Say, how about study? Do you want to work on it? I know it is hard. I know it is hard. But what are some ways, now question again, what are some ways to study better? What are some ways to study better? And then he might say, okay, study more. He might say, study more, read more. Listen to the teacher, he might say that. Okay, that's good, do it, do it. And then we can suggest to, we can suggest to them how you can do better. And now, now this is teaching now. Can I tell you how to study better? And right now I'm telling you too, here, how to study better. Why, why I learned so many things? Why me, Pastor Yip, have learned so many things? Why have I learned so many things from people? Even when I heard them one time, I can learn it. Why? Let me tell you the reason, my secret. You can say it with me. I treasure my life. I treasure the love of God. I want my life to go higher. I believe my life can go higher. And I actively observe people. If people have good qualities, I observe what is good about them. And I ask myself, can I learn from that person? What are his ways? Can I do the same thing? And what are the difficulties? So I actively learn from people. I actively observe people. And I remember what they did. And I apply what they did. In a simple, in, uh, to summarize it, I learn actively, say it, uh, actively. That means I actively look for things I can learn from people, say it. I actively look for things I can learn from people. So when I see something, I remember it. And then I apply it. Okay, so I hope this is what my experience. Do you actively learn? Do you learn actively? Yes. Some people do. Some people, let me tell you, learning is difficult because it's hard work. It's hard work. But some people just don't like to use the brain. Do you know the, one of the biggest tool we have here is our brain. Thank God we are not like an ant, you know, an ant or a little insect. The insect has little intelligence, but people have great intelligence. We can use our mind, right? And then you can go higher and higher. Now, I hope you mo I motivate you to become greater and greater. Okay, so with this how I motivate people. So just now, going back to counseling, now, just now I was teaching, but when I do the teaching, have you noticed my tone of voice and my content? Even though it is law, telling what to do, but I tell you in a very relaxed way that when you hear it, you don't feel pressure, right? Is that true? But some people teach like this. If you want to do good, you have to study. Study, study, study. <laughs> so. The way they talk already gives people a lot of, you know, pushing, a feeling of pushing them. And when people feel pushed, they don't like it. Don't, nobody likes to be pushed. So we understand this. We want to ask questions and motivate people. Now, let me say this again. To listen and to respond to people's feelings are very difficult. Yesterday in the small group I sat in, and also the people that came out, when someone says I have a problem, the other person will also always say, pray, go to the person to forgive the person, try to solve the problem. What is it? 
what are they doing? It is all teaching. It's teaching. So if someone, now for instance, you go to church and then someone sit next to you and you say, oh, I have a problem with my family. And then a person say, did you pray? Did you pray for him? Did you love him? Did you help him? How do you feel? Feel, feel guilty. Yeah, feel guilty and also the person is pushing you to change, right? Yeah. If this person always talk like that, whenever you have problem, you always tell you what to do, repent, read the Bible, kneel down to repent fast, and, and then obey God, and God will help you. If he always talk like that, how would you feel? Feel unhappy. You feel? Unhappy. Unhappy, uh-huh, and then pushed. So what I want to, you to learn to say now is something like this. I know it's difficult for you. Say it. I know, I know it's difficult for you. I have, now if you have something similar, you can say, I have had similar experiences. I have had similar experiences. And I felt bad at that time. And I felt bad at that time. I know it makes you feel unhappy. I know it makes you feel unhappy. Now, some people, especially pastors, don't like to say that. The reason is, I don't want this person to feel unhappy. And then I'm saying, I feel unhappy too. So it will make the person feel unhappy more. But let me tell you, that's not true. When you say, I can feel your unhappiness, it's just saying, I know how you are. It doesn't mean I want you to continue like that. And then we'll ask them, okay, later, we can ask them, so you feel unhappy now, do you want to change? Now the way is to guide them. Say it, the way is to guide them. The way is to guide them. Ask them questions. Ask them questions. It's not to, to teach directly. Not to teach directly. But we can ask, so how does this sadness affect you? Say it with me. How does this sadness affect you? Oh, this already, are these new ones? So how does how does your sadness affect you? Say it. How does your sadness affect you? So the person says, oh, it, it's not good. It, it makes me lose sleep. It makes me unhappy. Then we say, you say it with me. Do you want to overcome that? Do you want to overcome that? And how can we overcome that? Now these are questions we not want to ask. Let me say this again, okay? This is what we can say. I know it is difficult for you now. Say it. I know it's difficult for you now. And you feel unhappy. I can sense your unhappiness. I have had similar experiences. It was difficult. It was difficult. And um, now, after we, now, sometimes we need to understand more, ask more questions, understand more the situation. And then when we understand more, and then we'll say, how does it affect you? Say it. How does it affect you? When you are unhappy, how does it affect you? How does the relationship with your spouse affect you? Does it make you happy? Or does it make you unhappy? Do you want to do something about it? And what can you do about it? And then if the person talk and then you agree if it's right, if it's not right, then you can say, okay, now, what do you think would this work? And then you keep asking, what are some other ways? If he cannot name some ways, then you say, can I give you some suggestions? Say with me. Can I give you some suggestions? So instead of just telling them, you can ask, can I give you some suggestions? And then when a person says yes, then you give him some suggestions. And then at the end, what you do, you find out with some suggestions. And then you ask him, can you do it at home? Can you apply it at home? Say it with me. Can you apply it at home? And if the person says, maybe, maybe not. And then you say, how can you apply it more how can you really apply it? Say it. How can you really apply it? Is it possible? What are some ways? And then the person says, 
uh, I don't know, or maybe he, he knows one way. Uh, pray more, pray more, and trust in God, and keep reminding ourselves. Actually, the way is trust in God and keep reminding ourselves to take care of the problem. Say with me. Keep praying. Keep, pray. keep trusting God's love. Keep trusting God's love. And keep reminding ourselves to take care of the problems. Keep reminding For instance, not to be affected by people, we have to remind ourselves. He's saying something destructive. I have to remind myself, don't be affected. I don't have to lose joy. His words has no authority. I can rejoice in the Lord. I can trust in the Lord. I can overcome that. And I can also have compassion on Him and bless Him. So this is what we keep telling ourselves. So we become our own mentor. Say it. We become our own mentor. We keep reminding ourselves to follow God. And we keep comforting ourselves. And keep encouraging ourselves. And keep appreciating ourselves if we have done something good. So this is the process of counseling that we now I say it again. Now I say it all, but then you practice step by step. I say it all. First, now say it with me. First, listen. First is listen. Build up the relationship. And listen to his needs and problems. And then we'll respond to the feelings. We say it is difficult for them. I can feel your pain. Sometimes we need to find out more about the problem. Then we ask questions to find out more. Find out more about the problem. Say it. Find out more about the problem. And then lead them to find out the source of the problem. Lead them to find out the source of the problem. Now the source of the problem is not always in someone else. Sometimes it's in them. It's that they cannot take negative words, they get angry easily, they get frustrated easily. Sometimes it's in themselves. So we have to find out what are affecting them, you know, that how they are affecting themselves. So then we find out the root of the problem. The root of the problem may be this. The spouse is not good and they are not happy, so they fight back. And so every day is unhappy. So we realize that that's happening. And then we'll say, okay, now we have this problem. Do you, how does this problem affect you? Say it. How does this problem affect you? How does this problem affect you? Do you want to do something about the problem? Do you want to overcome the problem? What are some ways to overcome it? And then listen to him. And then he suggests something. And then we'll say, um, okay, does it work? Will it work? Say it with me. Will it work? Will it work? And then discuss with him if this is a good way. With him if this is a good way. And then if we find a good way, and then we ask, do you think you can do it at home? What are some hindrances? What are some ways that you can do it? And can you live in the love of God? Can you live in the love of God? And can you remind yourself to follow these methods? Can you remind yourself to follow these methods? Hello. So that and then whenever you can apply these principles, say it. So that whenever whenever I you can apply these principles, this one is better. Then you appreciate yourself. Then you appreciate yourself. And say you have done a good job. And you have done a good job. And you improve. And you improve. And God can raise you up. God can raise you up. Now, do you understand this process of simplifying counseling? Yes. You understand? Basically, it's not forcing people to change. It's not teaching people to change. It is guiding people to understand the problem. Guiding them to see the problem. 
The problem is not always in other people, it's all, also in themselves. So guiding them to understand the problem, and what are some of their problematic way of treating the problem. Now many people have problematic ways to treat the problem. For instance, the spouse is not happy with them, and then they get angry and they yell at the spouse. So the method is not good. But many people use this method, right? Yeah. Many people use the method of yelling, yelling back. He beat me, I'll beat him. He yelled at me, I'll yell at him. Most people use this method. And they're unhappy. It's not going to work. So we understand this. We guide them to realize, first you have peace. You're not affected by him. And then you take, don't take his words seriously. Then we can learn to be nice to him. Now, some people will not agree. Nice to him, he's so bad to me. But if he's bad to you and you, you are bad to him, then nothing can change, right? But if we are nice to him, one day it might change. Now please turn off your phone so that it won't, some of the phones, when they receive messages, then it will create this sound. So turn off your phones, please. Turn off the, uh, the message. Go into a flying mode. Flying Learn mode. Or meetings. So, so that it won't pick up messages, okay? So um, we'll ask, so we guide them to find the ways to see the problem and guide them, find the ways and then ask them if they can apply it. So this is basically counseling, leading them to find a solution and leading them to think about it, whether they can apply it or not. It is very different from teaching. Now teaching is necessary. For instance, now I'm teaching. Because you're ready to teach. You come here because you want to be taught. You want to learn. That's why I'm teaching. So when people want, they ask you, how can I be filled with the Holy Spirit? Then you just teach. It's not counseling, then it's teaching. But when people are emotional, unhappy, they are hurt, or they are not willing to change. Now, two big reasons why we need counseling. First, people are hurt and unhappy, say it. People are hurt and unhappy. Then they need comfort. They need comfort. Then they need comfort. So then we will comfort them. And guide them to be healed. Guide them to be healed. And then the second need for counseling is when people are not willing to change, the couples are fighting, then we want to guide them to see the problem. Guide them to see if they continue, they will lose the Christian uh, testimony and how to change and, and could lose salvation too and how to change and what are some possible ways to guide them to go through this because they're not willing to change if you just tell a couple go home and forgive each other and hug each other and do good to each other are they willing if they're fighting no no so when you teach they won't listen because they don't want to so we are trying to change someone i use an illustration this person want to, want to go a certain direction. He wants to go this way. You just tell him, turn back. He won't turn back. You're guiding him. If you keep going, now say it with me. If you keep going this direction, if you keep going this direction what will be the result? What will be the result? Do you want to change? Do you want to change? And what is good about turning back? What is good about turning back? How would it help you? How would it help you? And then can you turn back? And how can you turn back? How can you change? So you gradually guide the person to understand he needs to turn back and change his way. That's the need for counseling. Let me ask you, how many, how many people in your church have problematic ways and they're not willing to change? How many people are like that? Let me ask you. How many people are like that? Sometimes many, right? Sometimes many. So for many, all these people, you just teach them to love God and serve God. You just preach a sermon. Love God and serve God. Are you willing to raise their hand? But when they go home, they forget all about it because they're not really willing. So you gradually guide them in counseling, in cell groups, and even in the sermon. If you notice how I preach, I always give people the reasons to change. I guide them to change and tell them how, why it's difficult to change and then how to change. So I, 
I gradually guide them to change and tell them the ways to change. Instead of just saying, repent, believe in God, obey God, do evangelism, serve God. If we just tell people that, then in Chinese we say it's just like the wind by the ear, right? And then in Chinese we also say this, it enters by the left ear and come out by the right ear. <laughs> so people won't take it if you just tell people just to do something they originally don't want to do. Or your children, you tell them, how many times you tell them, don't use, don't play with the cell phone all the time. Don't play all the time. And they just keep ignoring you, right? So we need to guide them step by step. And also just teaching people also make people unhappy, right? They will dislike you. Okay, now any question about counseling? Is it important? Yes. Do you understand the concept of counseling? To let people know they're going this way and the problem. And, how, and, and this, to let them know, it's not just by telling. When you doing, keep doing this, you're offending God, you're sinning, you can lose salvation. It's, this is teaching. So we ask them, how would it affect you? How would it affect your relationship with people? How would it affect your relationship with God? To ask people, let people say it. Because when people say it, then they think through it, and then they will absorb it more. Say this with me. When we ask people questions, when we ask people questions they think about how to answer. In the process of thinking, they would, the idea would sink into the mind more. And they remember the process. And they remember the process. And they remember the conclusion. And they remember the conclusion. And they will change more when they think. And they will change more when they think. Okay. Now, any question? Now, I'm giving you the concept, but I not tell you it's very difficult to learn because people have to have a master degree to do counseling, and I'm trying to do it in one day's time. Yes. Yes. Um, if you have somebody who does not believe certain teaching. For example, the doctrine of eternal security. And this person is very dear to you. And the person is trying to correct that person or to express your opinion and understanding from the scriptures what it means. The person wants to go into hot argument. How can you gradually bring the person to understanding the concept? Okay. okay, thank you. Now, when it's a difference of opinion, when it's a difference of opinion, we can still use counseling. But I want to say this too. First, decide whether this issue is worth talking about at this point. The reason is, every church I go to, they might have doctrines I don't agree. But I don't have to change all the doctrines. I don't come to change people's doctrines. I want, I want to come to raise up people's spiritual life and how to train them to serve God. There might be differences. In a, in a Christian churches, there are different opinions. I cannot go and change everyone's opinion. So, so first thing is, we don't have the job to change everyone's opinion or theology. Now, if it's someone close to you and you think it's important, you decide. Then what we do, instead of just arguing, if two persons argue, you say it's A, the person says B, you say A, B, A, B. Does it change a person? No. no. So we want to ask him, why do you believe in A? Why do you believe in A? What makes you believe in A? What are the support? And let them study the Bible and find out and tell you. Okay, these are the reasons. Sometimes when they study, they find that they don't have the support. They might have some support. Okay, and then you say, how about these Bible verses? How can you reconcile it? How can you find a solution? So to guide them to think and to find out for themselves and to discuss together. And then, after a while you see, okay, now you see that the Bible verses really support that people can lose salvation. This is what we, we talk about. Then, are you willing to change? Instead of saying, now you change. I would say, are you willing? Do you see a problem with that teaching? Do you see a problem with that teaching? So if there is some, there is problem with the teaching, can you change? 
Actually, why people, now I'm just sidetracking a little bit. About eternal security, once safe, always safe. The problem is they are using verses of, of election that the elect cannot lose salvation. The sheep of Jesus will not lose salvation. To mean that everyone who once believed, the point is, the people who once believed, are they the elect? So you can ask them to study the Bible. Does it mean all those people who believe once, they are the elect? If they are not, then it's just the elect who have the eternal security. And but sometimes on earth, we don't know who are the elects. But if we keep trusting in God, we keep believing in God and have a close relationship with God, then we are the elect. So that's the point, to lead them. So any dis disagreement, we find out why you think that way and what are the supports and then how we can find a solution. This is a better way. For instance, in your co-working situation, when you work with someone, sometimes you disagree with your co-worker, right? Yes, sir. Or your co-workers disagree with you and you try to change. You have to change. Why don't you change? Now, even if he doesn't disagree with you openly, he might disagree with you secretly. So we want to ask them to think. Your way of thinking, your way of taking care of pro our problems, is it a good way? What are some bad consequences? What are some, uh, you know, what are some possible ways to resolve this problem? So we guide people to think. And also we guide ourselves too. We are not always right. Don't, first thing, we are not always right. We have to find out if we are wrong in a certain issue. Okay, any question? Yes. Yes. Now if you have questions, please line up here. Now only questions related to counseling. No other question, okay? No other question. Please come here. Yeah, Remy, you have told all the importance of counseling. Okay. I understand that very well. Good. But when is it more appropriate to offer counseling? Is it that you wait until you are asked to? Or do you just see the problem and you go in to counsel somebody? Okay, thank you. All right. Counseling actually can be in daily life. When your wife talks with you and disagree with you, and now if you think that you have the right perspective, then you can use counseling skill already. You can find out why do you think that's a better way? And do you think, uh, do you think my way is, there's some problem with it? What can I, uh, uh, why should we change and how can we change? So even in daily conversation, in evangelism, actually we are using, doing counseling, but many people don't do, use counseling methods. What they do? Believe in Jesus, if not, you go to hell. Do you want to go to hell? Do you want to go to heaven? You go to heaven, then you have to believe in Jesus. That's only teaching and pushing. But counseling applied evangelism would be like this. Have you thought about if there is a God? It's asking question. Very important to guide a person. Have you thought about if there is a God? Have you thought about if there is a heaven? Now, if there is a heaven, do you want to go to heaven? And do you know which way is the way? Which way is the way? Now Christians say, our way is the way, but how do we know it's true? Now first you need to know why we know the Christian way is the way. And why we know the Buddhists and the other religions are not bringing people to heaven. Why? So we know, and then we ask this person. Now it depends on the person. If the person has a lot of hearts, then we say, when you're living under these hearts, how does it make you feel? And how is it affecting you? How is your sleep? How is your relationship with people? Uh, do you feel happy? So do you want to change? Do you want to experience the love of God, the peace of God? And then if you want to, can I pray with you? And also we can share how we have suffering and how God changed us and healed us. And can I pray for you to experience God? So I'm guiding him instead of pushing him. It's useful in all ways of communication instead of just pushing people, even in preaching, instead of just preaching strongly, we can say, now think about it. If we are weak, we are weak in Jesus Christ, what will be the results? Even in a sermon, we can ask people to think, is it the right way? Fornication, is it the right way? Should, 
what are some possible solutions? How to solve the problem? So we lead people to think and lead people to understand and then lead people to find ways to solve the problem and how to solve the problem. So this is basically a way to guide someone who is turning this way to realize his way may not be correct, that he wants to turn back and to guide him sometimes the change is not just one time change. It could be many times. For Christians who really follow God, how many times does he have to change? It's not just once. You believe in Jesus is once, but we need to believe God. God is good. I need to trust in Jesus, pray to God, obey God, turn away from lies, turn away from greed, turn away from fornication, and obey God and serve God. We have many of these turns in our whole lifetime. Every day, every day. But if Christians, they are willing to follow God totally, then we submit to God anytime. Then we already have counseled ourselves to obey God completely. Now I have counseled myself. To follow God is the best way, so I don't have to convince myself every time. If someone speak impolitely to me, already I have convinced myself if he speak impolitely, it is his problem. I will not take it seriously. I will find ways to soften the relationship and to guide him to, to not to be impolite and how to solve the problem. So I have counseled myself to agree with God 100% of the time. Now, of course, sometimes I still have blind spots and then I will be willing to learn from God. So what I'm saying is I have counseled myself that I'm totally ready but not many Christians are like that. Now, any questions? Yes. Yes. One question. Okay. Amen. Amen. I want to ask this. In the area of counseling, when somebody you counsel the person from time to time, because this is a continuous process, and the person realizes his or her mistakes, but every time you fall short of. Force. Yeah, he fall, you know, he Force. made a mistake. Oh, he made it. He continue the same way. And when he realized he made the same mistake, he will cry and cry, God forgive him. He continue in that system. And when you have counseled the person for how long, then what should, what should you do as a pastor, pastoring that person? Okay. As I said before, in a church, it's like a pyramid. At the bottom are people who are disobeying God all the time, who are very weak, and then high up people willing to serve God, and then take care of problems, and then have strategy to serve God. It goes higher and higher. There are people who learn very fast. There are people who are willing to repent very fast. These are the people we want to concentrate in. Now, if we want to counsel everyone, every problematic person in the church, it can take all our time. How to use our time is wisdom. Because people who are willing to change are the people who want to counsel more, to guide them to go enter the most perfect plan of God. Now, people who are always weak, what we can do is ask them, okay, last time I, we, we agreed that you want to work on this. Now, how come this time you still have problem. Where does it go wrong? Can you think about that? And then can you find ways not to repeat the same mistake? And also, so, so to let the person take the responsibility. That's very important. Say it with me. Let the person take his responsibility. Don't take all his responsibilities. Don't take all his responsibilities. We can just ask what went wrong. Why couldn't you obey? Why didn't you why couldn't you follow this disagreement? So what is wrong there? And then when you find out what's wrong, then you ask him, how can you resolve it? Now that's one solution. Another solution is we have to train people to be willing to counsel. Train many people. So anyone who comes in, anyone who is in a church, we have someone to counsel them, to guide them, to help them. That way, if you have many counselors in the church, then the church will be very strong. If this counselor, now, let me tell you, counselor need to have a good relationship with God, and also they need to have good wisdom. Yeah. 
because not everyone knows how to handle problems. If people are entangled in problems, they cannot counsel people because they themselves don't know how to handle their problems. How, they, they, how can they counsel other people? Okay? Any questions related to this? Yeah. Are you asking? Okay. Now, um, is it time for lunch? Yes. yes. Okay, please, please. Come. Uh -huh. Can I counsel myself? Yes. How? Yes. How? Well, you ask yourself, why am I unhappy? What's wrong? Is it only wrong with other people? So you're asking questions for yourselves. Do I have something that I did wrong? And how about my attitude? What's wrong with it? And find out the attitude problem. And then, how can I change? How can I change? What are some ways? Actually, all people, all Christians, should counsel themselves constantly. And in psychology, they have a term for that, self-talk. You talk to yourself all the time and help yourself to turn the right way. To turn yourself, turn to the right way to follow God. So we need to counsel ourselves. And what's wrong? If people examine themselves, what is wrong? Is it only the fault of my spouse or someone else? Or is it my fault also? So we find out what's wrong with us. And then we counsel ourselves to change. And then we change. Then this is a wise person. This is a wise person. Okay, now, yes, you want to ask something? Yeah, come, come up. Don't worry. Yes, you are talking about counseling. If you are counseling someone, they are not have God's spirit in that person. But what do you do for that person to me? The person what? Counsel somebody. That person is proud of God. 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 What, you mean he's not a Christian? He's not a Christian? Yes, God's spirit in that person. Well, if he's not a Christian, then you counsel him according to him as a non-Christian. Even non-Christian, you can counsel. For instance, your family member is fighting with you all the time, and then you ask him, um, can you tell me um, what causes you to be unhappy, or uh, what happened last night? Can you tell me what happened last night to you? Did I do anything wrong? And the person says, oh, uh, uh, you, you refuse to let me take the money away. Okay, <laughs> the person wants to stick, take some money away, and then you refuse to let me take the money. Okay, so do you want me to continue to give you the money every time you ask for it? And then what happens if every time you ask for money, I'll give it to you, what will happen to the family? So this is counseling. It's basically guiding the person to understand the problem. Guiding the person to understand the need to change. But at the same time, we, under, we respond to the feelings. I know, I know you want the money and then I cannot give it to you. I wish I had millions and millions of dollars and I can give you continually, but I don't. So <laughs> I know it's hard for you. Okay? Now, now we have... In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, ready? Right Stand up. Look at the camera. Uh, in Jesus' my name. Amen. Uh, I want to know who are those the council and what are the factors that led to negative counseling? Who are those counsel? Yeah, who are those the council? I want what to are the factors, factors that led to negative to negative counseling? Negative counseling. Yeah. Okay. Who can counsel? They have to be trained. It's not just one session. Hopefully, I have a training today that you can learn it, but it takes time to learn. It really takes time to learn. And the person needs to have a good relationship with God and also take care of his problem and have wisdom. The wisdom came from how we handle the problems. The wisdom also came from how to help people. And where did bad counseling come from? Bad counseling came from bad attitude and bad beliefs. Beliefs that I have to yell at people. I have to force people to change. People are bad. People have no hope. And bad attitude and also the attitude of being rough with people. When people are rough with people, they cannot counsel. They, need, they get angry easily, they need to counsel themselves. Why do they have so much anger? Now, if you have anger, you have to counsel yourself to find the reason why you have the anger. How can we counsel? 
And if you have a problem with the family members, ask yourself, is it just a problem of the family members? Do I have a problem also? How can I change? So we need to counsel ourselves. We have, it's, I would say this, the counselors are a selected small group in the church. But hopefully it will grow gradually to be a larger group. But first the pastor needs to learn it. Let me tell you, it is very hard to learn. This afternoon, after lunch, now during lunch time you can practice too. You can have three persons sitting together eating, and then one person share about the problem, and one person respond, and the third person observe. Is the person feeling, now say this question, is the person, is the counselor feeling the feeling of the counselee? Say it. Is the counselor feeling the feeling of the counselee? Is the person expressing empathy? Is the person expressing empathy? Does did the person feel the other person feeling? Does the person respond in a comforting way? Does the person bring comfort to the person? Does the person force the other person to change? Does the person, does the person, does the counselor guide the counselee? Does the counselor teach too fast? So you watch that. And then after lunch, you can tell me. Let me tell you, it takes a lot of practice. If you can learn it today, I would say you are super natural. Most people cannot learn it in such a short time, but hopefully you can learn it, especially the pastors. You learn it and you can apply it. You are very, very good. So God bless you. Yes, sir. Somebody want to ask a question? Yes. Come quickly. Okay, um, we know that counseling is habitual, right? So how is it to be measured? In a sense, can a counselor be counseled? Yes. Counselor should Three. first be counseled and helped and clear of all his problems before he can be a counselor. And what did he ask another question? Just that, just that. That's, so that's training. Now, I have skipped many things. I have skipped the quality of a counselor. The inner qualities. There are many qualities in the counselor that need to build up. The relationship with people, ability to communicate, ability, the EQ to handle his own problem, the, the wisdom to observe people, the wisdom to know what are the problems, and uh, empathy for people, love for people, all these are necessary. And then he can accept himself and like himself. He doesn't like himself, he cannot be a counselor. But actually, many people function as a counselor when they do it by themselves, but they are just bad counselors.